We've been fighting on this rock for 400 rotations at least. During 400 rotations, we've been facing down the Imperial forces, and all that is done is cause a stalemate across the planet. Across all three continents, all you see is a battle line on each side. Each side is diving in, getting deeper and deeper into the mud that's there. The walls barely holding up without any type of support. On top of the mud, if you can find any stone, you will find hardened defenses. Those are going to be almost impossible to crack. The amount of reinforcements we're going to need is going to be insane. Wait, we're getting fresh reinforcements? Oh, no, that's the Imperials just got fresh reinforcements. What did they get? I find out that they are getting an amphibious species. Great. Amphibians do extremely well in a mud-covered ball of a flying through space like this one. Just, ah, just, our lines are close to breaking already. Aren't we finally going to get reinforcements? Oh, we are. What type of reinforcements are we going to get? Are we getting our special forces? No. Well, what about a heavy weapons unit? Oh, no, not them either, huh? Well, what about those hover tanks we've been begging for? Not a chance. That was a nice way of putting it. Well, what will we get? What the... What in all of the blue hells is a humans? No, we're getting humans. What's a humans? What? I look over and I can see the transports coming down. They are way behind the line. So far, in fact, that there's no way they're going to get here in time. If the enemy attacks soon, which they will, we know they will, there's not going to be anything left but a burial ground as they collapse in our trenches and just roll over top of our smoldering corpses. Oh, what the hell are they going to do? That's way too far. That's not reinforcements. That's somebody just pick up the bodies. With that, something crashes near the lines. What the hell was that? Then a lot of something start crashing in. And then armored bipedals begin to exit each of these strange metal things that have crashed in. They run to the line, jump over the line, scaring the living crap out of all of us, and just keep going. As they do this, we hear motors begin to spin up, and then all of a sudden they begin to fire out with some sort of strange ballistic weapon I haven't seen before. Astonished, I look around, and then one of them drops into the trench. I hear a voice, a trangular voice. Who's in charge? This armored biped jumps over towards me as fast as possible. As soon as I say, I'm in charge. Situation. Barely holding on. That We have far too many wounded. We can no longer hold. We are combat ineffective. Lead me to your wounded. With that, we immediately head over towards the holding area. Inside, many of ours are barely holding on, just screeching, many of them, as they are in severe pain from the strange weapons that are being used. The energy weapons tend to burn in, and when they do, if they get past the carapace, they'll simply burn out everything that's inside us. Those of the forces that are not crustacean like me, well... Their skin sometimes helps as they're covered in fur, but they're still not doing much better. There's just too many of them, as you can see. We, we can't abandon them. You don't have to. Medic! Two lightly armored bipeds immediately came over, running as fast as possible. There was a strange symbol on them. I couldn't figure out what it was. It was difficult to see, as it was kind of a dark red on top of that black outfit it was wearing. They dropped packs from their backs and each of them landed with a very loud thump. All I could think of is, those must be heavy. Watching them go to work, that thought was immediately replaced with another. It's like watching a miracle. The technology they were using as these medical personnel ran over and began to heal everyone extremely quickly. It was odd. Every time they went to one, they were only dealing with them for maybe a minute, maybe two. And then we had our own people back in the fight. They were up and running, ready to go. The armored biped 
motions to get back into the fight. This is when I learned his name. Lieutenant Schroeder grabs all those who can fight and then jumps out of the trench line. He begins to wave and calling to go forward and leads them to reinforce the human forces already on the first enemy line. With that, it is an absolute melee by the time we get there. The enemy forces are around the armored humans, and but they can't believe what they're seeing. The forces of the humans are advancing into the lines, just not stopping. They're using explosions to clear their way into the lines, throwing them all the way across as they explode inside the trench lines. And then suddenly they jump up and land in the trench line, taking out everyone that's in there. Once inside, they're glad to go claw to, well, I found out later it's called a hand. The enemy's claws would come at them, barely scratching on the surface of those strange metal suits. And then the humans would simply ball up this hand into, I think they call it a feist, and strike them down with enough power to break bones. The lieutenant insists that they clear the defenses one by one. The forces spread out across the line and continue to do so. Watching Lieutenant Schroeder lead his men was like watching a conductor operate an orchestra waving his arms around in motions just to make sure everybody knew what was going on, giving commands over the radio and sometimes using the PA system, yet the sounds of battle were almost deafening. Within an hour, the first and second lines of the enemy had been taken. That is when the new amphibious species joined the enemy lines. They came up using their strong legs and began to jump in, thinking they would be able to close the distance really quick. They would find out that the humans already had a weapon to stop them. A weapon so powerful that when it was fired, not only was it deafening, but whatever struck the amphibians forced them to flip back in many, many pieces. The humans call it a war crime stick. They used this to push forward. They loved using it, yet it seemed to have limited ammunition and they would switch back to their regular weapons. The amphibians decided they would be slick about this. They would be smart, and they decided to dig into the mud, using their bodies to sway deeper and deeper in to the point where they were barely even noticeable, but you would have to be looking for them in that specific area to see them, and they would lay a trap for the humans. They believed they would be able to reach out and get them point-blank range. As the humans got close to the third line and jumped in, the amphibians attacked, jumping out of the mud and advancing as hard as they could. With this, the advance stalls. Somewhere in this fog of war, as they call it, the lieutenant was hit. An armored biped simply picked up his limp body, threw it over top, and seemed to run back through the mud, not even caring that the mounted weight was starting to sink him so deep it was amazing that those bipeds could even raise their legs. I could hear the servo motor straining every time he picked up his legs. It was absolutely crazy. But at this time, the line suddenly went up in smoke. In the midst of the melee, artillery, energy bolts, ballistic fire, it was all mixed together, and then the human showed their pyromania. It seemed without the lieutenant there to slow them down. Those humans left on the ground decided they were not going to simply clear a room by throwing an explosive in. No, they were going to burn it to the ground. They would send a blast of flaming plasma inside, and all you could hear was screaming ammo exploding, and then you saw bodies crawl, run, and fall out of every orifice that the entire bunker may have. It was horrific. The smell was enough to give you all sorts of nightmares. The humans seemed to lose all sense of reason as each of the buildings began to crumble under this onslaught. In this absolute chaos, there was one thing that stood out, one constant that was there. Every time one of these medics would show up, armored bipeds would always move to protect them. 
Always. There was never an exception to this. The medic armor was lighter, so this made perfect sense as I looked at it. This allowed them to reach those who were wounded faster. Showing the protection did not go unnoticed from the other side as well. When one of these medics ran up to treat a heavy rapid fire ballistic machine carrier, a call was heard over the communications array, a broad spectrum announcement. It seemed to make the entire line pause as it went out. When they heard this, all the humans seemed to stop, and they all turned to look to see if it was true. As soon as they heard, Doc's down! The heavy armored biped seemed to suddenly want to expel all his ammunition into the enemy line at once. Firing not only his main guns, but his strange missile and mortar rounds came out in a massive volley that seemed to erupt the front lines, not even giving the first care that he may clip his own people in the process. It seemed that he was screaming as I could hear him from inside his own helmet, and he was not alone. The fury of the humans forced an entire route of the next line as they were suddenly given a very large dose of what the humans call nightmare fuel. They all seemed to be focused on the destruction of the hardened defense point that they believed fired on their medic. This position was the one that shot Doc. Explosions from every launcher landed near or on top of this position. There were shots everywhere. Full automatic fire from heavy weapons began spraying out without pause. Usually they go out and burst, but it seems as though they were hell-bent on expelling all their ammunition on this one point. And before the position had even a chance to figure out what type of mistake they had made, they were already being flanked by a group of humans that jumped into the position and began to tear into them bare-handed. They simply left their weapons on their back and seemed to go in and want to tear this position apart. Reaching up with giant armored hands, they grabbed a hold of the enemy and started ripping appendages off, even getting in the rage ripping an arm, a leg, maybe more than one of the arms off before throwing the body outside another one of the orifice and out onto the ground, letting the wounded sit there and bleed out. Seeing this, the Imperial forces began a full-on retreat. Human artillery fire began, harassed them until they were completely out of range. However, they did take out many of them, and, well, they were only out of range for now. After the mad rush across all the enemy lines, I was just exhausted, bruised, and bleeding. The human walked up. One of them noticed that I was not in fighting condition at all. In fact, I had been hit several times, most of which were grazing shots, but... They were still enough that they were concerned. The human just walked up, didn't even bother to raise its visor, and simply spoke through the suit and said, Come on, let's get you to Doc. I was confused as the human simply lifted me up and seemed to cradle me almost in its arms. As it began to move back, I thought it was going to be a long walk, but then suddenly... It opened up the sides and jumped across the battlefield using strange thermal thrusters I didn't know they even had. After just a few of these jumps, we ended right next to the medical treatment area. As I was placed down, I simply asked, Why didn't you use that in combat? He simply seemed to turn and look at me, almost confused, and said, Makes us a nice, easy, and juicy target up there. I didn't have to fight his logic, as we did spend several moments in the air that made us a very easy target to hit. Upon entering the treatment area, holding my injury from bleeding too much, one of the human medics ran over and brought me to what they call a folding table to be worked on. Walking over, I noticed far less wounded 
I know they hadn't all died and men moved out. Did they really fix that many? I was absolutely shocked when I saw the LT walk up without his head covering. The first time I had seen a human without their helmet on. But I did recognize the name on his uniform. I thought you were dead. I saw you fall. The LT, seemingly with a predatory grin, looked and said, You never know we humans are dead until you look inside this boxy suit. Besides, I'm no pussy. I was confused at that remark as many of the other humans thought about this and seemed to chuckle at it. I looked to the other side of me and again was shocked. A human was sitting down, helmet and torso protection removed, yet I looked over at the armor and I saw it was, it was, it was the doc. It was, I thought he was dead. What the, how are you not dead? I could read on the side of the armor, Peterson. I knew that was him. That had to be him. The medic was using string, just string and some sort of curved metal to mend a wound like someone would mend a piece of cloth. Looking close, the wound was on his left side, mid-torso. It looked like an energy bolt had penetrated his armor and the result of the energy burst into his flesh looked like it had basically thermal burned and then exploded in a tiny little explosion. It was partially cauterized, which was good, but for me, that would be lethal. I mean, I, I'd be dead as a slow and painful death from something like that. As I looked at it, as he seemed to nonchalantly, slowly move his hand up and down, again closing the wound, he looked up as he finished and must have seen me looking all sorts of pale. I watched him continue to sew up his wounds without hesitation. The proficiency he showed was that of someone who was well practiced in his craft. The doc again noticed me watching as he finally snipped the line after he tied it, turned up and smiled. Don't worry, I was just grazed. <laughs>